you, everybody. It is wonderful to be here and to have another opportunity to uh, preach a portion of God's Word to you. I hope that it's something that will benefit you. And, of course, we're continuing through our study in the book of Hebrews this morning. And this is really an exciting study this morning, but it's also one that is good for all of us to take into consideration. It's important for all of us to consider the things that we're warned about in the Scriptures. God has given us a word that has communicated to us what He expects of us. And He's given us warnings. He's given us admonitions uh, that have encouraged us to continue on the straight and narrow path. And that's something that we're going to be talking about this morning. I appreciate Brother Marcus reading our text this morning so eloquently. I appreciate that. And uh, you might have noticed that we skipped over the first 11 verses of chapter 5. And the reason for that is we're going to talk about that as we talk about chapter 7 and 8. Because those things are directly connected. So we're just going to talk about the last three verses of chapter 5 and the first eight verses of chapter 6 this morning. If you remember in our last study, we discussed the Holy Spirit's reminder to these discouraged Christians that received this letter that there did remain, and that there still does for us, remain a promise of eternal rest, and therefore some must enter into it. An exhortation was also given to be diligent to enter that rest by living out the Word of God. And the writer explains that the Word of God is living and powerful and is sharper than any two-edged sword and is piercing to the division of the soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And that's an important thing for us to think about this morning, especially going into what we're talking about for our lesson today. And how appropriate is it for the subjects of the power of God's Word and the... Uh, in the eternal rest that is promised to be found parallel in the Word of God. And the reason they're found so close together and in such close association is because there's a direct connection between the Word of God and entering God's rest. Now, what is that connection that we find between those two things? Well, before we can answer that, we have to understand that the Word of God is the source of all truth. What does that mean? Well, that means if we want to know what God's will is for our lives... We don't go based on what our natural feelings are or whatever instincts we have or whatever inclination we might have uh, to decide what God's will is for our lives. We don't go to the library and look for a book by Joel Austin or Joyce Meyer or something and look up the chapters and, and, and read to find out what God's will is and what His plan is for our life. If we want to know what God's will is for us, if we want to know what God expects of us, if we want to know what God wants us to do to be well-pleasing to Him, the only place, the only book, the only source that we can take counsel from is the Word of God. It gives us all the answers. We don't have to go into judgment wondering what we're going to be judged by or wondering how we're going to be judged. Here's the thing. God wills that none of us should perish. But he's not going to force you to accept that gracious offer of salvation. Because whenever we read that word of God, that's what we learn. We learn that God wills that none of us should perish, but that all of us should enter that eternal rest. God has graciously delivered a written word to us to use so that we have no questions about what he expects of us. We don't enter judgment without an opportunity to seek God's will. See, that would be unjust. And we know the foundation of God's throne is righteousness and justice, according to Psalm 89 and verse 14. So what is the connection between God's word and entering God's rest? That's an important question for us to answer this morning and for us to keep in our minds and our hearts as we travel on through this life. Jesus shed some light on this question in John chapter 12, verse 48 through 50. He says, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that this command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. So that tells us that the word judges us. The word is what's going to, to determine whether or not we enter that rest. But how do we do that? How do we determine whether or not we're going to enter that rest? Well, that's uh, our testimony, of course. That, that our life is a testimony as to whether or not we have used the Word of God to chart our course. We know we have to use the Word of God as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. 
The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 and 10, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So here's the picture that we need to keep in our minds. This is the inescapable fact of each of our lives. We're going to stand before Jesus Christ one day and be judged. And how is he going to judge us? What standard is he going to use? What rubric is he going to follow? What's he going to judge us by? Jesus is going to make a righteous final judgment as to whether or not we have made it our aim to be well-pleasing to him. How do we determine whether or not we have made it our aim to be well-pleasing to him in our life? Well, he's going to look at our lives in the light of the word that he has spoken. And then he's going to make a determination. He will determine whether or not we have striven daily to abide by those words that he has delivered. So we don't have to sit and wring our hands and wonder how judgment is going to go. Because we have Bibles and we can read them, we can apply them. And if you read something in the New Testament scripture and you don't do it, you're not making it your aim to be well-pleasing to him. It's as simple as that. You know whether or not pleasing the Lord is the aim of your life. We all know that. We might have our family full. We might have our brothers and sisters in Christ full. You might have me full. You might even have yourself full. But we read in Hebrews chapter 4, uh, chapter four and verse 13 in our last lesson that there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. <clears throat> you know why folks fail to make pleasing the Lord their aim? And the most common reason for that, and really the only reason. Well, it's for the same reason that the recipients of this letter had failed. Unbelief. That's the reason. There's no doubt that they believed with great zeal in the beginning. We have no question about that. They were willing to give up everything. They were willing to sacrifice all they had. They were willing to face the persecutions. They knew what was coming. I'm sure they didn't expect it to be as severe as it was. But at one point, they were willing to give up everything for Jesus. But as times got difficult, they started losing that zeal and losing that belief because life is hard. The devil is smart and temptation can be overwhelming. That initial belief that you have is not going to last if it's not nurtured. We know that whenever we first obey the gospel, we have this passion, we have this zeal and this excitement, and we can keep that. It's possible to keep that. But it's not possible to keep it if you don't nourish it and if you don't continue to build upon that and continue to develop that. But how did these folks reach this point, those who are receiving this letter? They're still in the church as they're receiving this letter and as it's being read aloud to them. But they're standing on the edge of the kingdom walls. And they're looking down and they're ready to jump to their doom. But how could they get to a decision like that? What would cause someone to get to that point in their life? How could they consider such a decision? Well, that's kind of what we're talking about in our lesson today. Spiritual immaturity. <clears throat> that's the reason they got to that point. <coughs> Because they didn't build upon that initial faith that they had. They might have to some extent. But they didn't continue to press on toward maturity in Christ. They've not grown. Their faith has not been nurtured. So what is the focus of our scripture today? Well, it's exactly that. He's writing to a group of Christians who are polluted with spiritual immaturity. And it's their own fault. Because it's been brought about by their failure to nurture their faith in Jesus Christ and in the promises of God. So the writer begins his line of thought with this rebuke in verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 5. He says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. So this letter has found these Christians in a deplorable condition. <clears throat> Evidently, they've been Christians for a long time, and they've been Christians long enough that they should have reached a level of maturity that's required to teach others the hope that they have in Jesus Christ, 
teach them how to become Christians, to make disciples themselves. That's a goal that we should all have as Christians. It's not just obeying the gospel and keeping our seat warm until <coughs> our time comes to depart from this life. That's not what Christianity is. We have to live by the Great Commission. Jesus said that we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, and he who does not believe shall be condemned. He also says, and teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. He says to make disciples of all the nations. To make a disciple means to develop mature Christians. And a bunch of babes in Christ cannot develop mature Christians. And one mature Christian in a congregation cannot develop everybody. We have to be striving as individuals every day to develop ourselves and to reach maturity in Christ. This is not only the responsibility of men who teach from the pulpit. This is not just the responsibility of preachers. This is not just the responsibility of husbands and fathers who leave the home. Every individual Christian is responsible, regardless of their age or their gender, to strive every day to grow as a Christian. Your goal should be to teach others also. That's part of my work as an evangelist here. Paul instructed the evangelist Timothy to teach as part of his responsibilities. And folks could not teach others unless they had been taught themselves. I have a lot of Bible studies with families in this congregation right now, but my long-term goal is not to be one of the only two or three people that lead Bible studies in our congregation. My goal is to prepare other people and equip other people to lead Bible studies themselves, maybe in their home, maybe through conversations about the gospel, or perhaps preparing some of our men to teach publicly at some point. We have to continue to grow and develop as a congregation. But you can never teach anyone if you stay on the milk, and if you never move on to the meat. See, many of these folks who received this letter have been Christians for a long time, and they've had more than adequate opportunity to grow in their faith. They've had plenty of chances to grow in their knowledge of Jesus Christ, but the letter says here to God's disappointment that they need someone to teach them again the first principles of the oracles of God. What are these first principles of the oracles of God? Well, in this context, the writer is referring to the knowledge that they had of the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. These folks had obviously forgotten in facing their troubles that Jesus had fulfilled some 300 prophecies, proving himself beyond the shadow of any doubt to be the Messiah, to be the Son of God. They were just glazing over those reminders and focusing only on the old law. They were only focusing on what they wanted to focus on because that was the life where they had comfort where they had peace, where they had contentment. That's where they wanted to be. Because this new life in Christ as a first century Christian was hard. They were facing terrible challenges. Their families forsook them. They were at odds with the government. They couldn't trade in the marketplace in some cases. And they wanted to go back to the life they used to live. And that's the reason they were desiring to return to the bondage of the law. Where there's no longer salvation from sin. This is a rebuke that the writer's giving them, that the Holy Spirit is delivering. The writer says, you need someone to teach you again the fact that Jesus is the Christ. What if that happened to one of us? You need to be taught again that Jesus is the Christ. That would be shameful, wouldn't it? That would be a shameful condition to find ourselves in. He is the one who was raised up from among you, whose words are superior to the words that were delivered through Moses. They were in a shameful state. Their hearts were darkened and hardened. So what are these first principles of the oracles of God in the context of the Christian who's living some 20 centuries after this letter was penned? What application can we make? Well, it's the same as it was for them. We must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We must believe that with all of our heart. And the key word to that statement is believe. If we truly believe that Jesus is God's Son, if we believe that Jesus did what the Scriptures teach for the reason the Scriptures proclaim, that will be the driving force for our growth toward maturity. But my fear is that many of us do not believe as much as we want that eternal rest. We have a good we we have a, a longing to be in heaven. We want at the end of our lives to be accepted. 
into, into that eternal rest of God. But we don't want to do what it takes to get there. We don't want to follow what the Word of God teaches us. We want to kind of ride along and take the easy route. But I'm telling you, there is no easy route. There is no effortless route to eternity. But whoever accomplished a task without working for it? We know the answer to that. <clears throat> so even if we do sincerely believe that Jesus is the Christ, that's still the milk of the matter. And that milk is intended to prepare us for further growth. Verse 13 says, For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So we're given a contrast here now between babies and adults. The babies represent new converts that are still working on understanding those elementary principles of the Christian faith. And I want to make it very clear that there's nothing wrong with this stage. There's nothing wrong with being a babe in Christ. Because that's a stage that we all have to be in at some point. Whenever we obey the gospel, we are converted and we become born again. We're a babe in Christ. And we have to progress beyond that. We have to have that milk first. Just like a baby when it's born has to have milk to prepare it to grow and then be able to eat meat. And that's in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense, we must be able to move on from the milk and on to the meat. We must strive for that. The adults spoken of here are those who are of full age, and that represents those who study the Word, those who meditate on it, those who apply it, those who teach it to others, and those who are able to discern between good and evil. You know, those who are of full age are living out the Word, and they're a shining light that penetrates a great amount of darkness in this world. One who is of full age, spiritually speaking, does not have to be asked if they're a Christian. And they don't have to convince somebody that they're a Christian either. They're not the type of person that's having a conversation with someone and you tell them where you go to church and they say, Oh, I didn't even know you went to church. You're not a mature Christian. If somebody didn't realize that you're a Christian, they're going to realize that by the conversations they have with you, by the example that you set, by the way you treat others, they're going to be able to tell. Now, of course, that takes work. And that takes effort. We're going to talk about what that looks like in just a few minutes. We must also understand that whether one is a babe in Christ or of full age has nothing to do with our physical age. This is a spiritual metaphor here. And perhaps you've been a Christian for 50 years. And if you have, that's wonderful. But that amount of time has nothing to do with your spiritual age. You might have heard a thousand sermons preached. But if you've not spent any time growing, and if you've done nothing to apply what you've heard in those sermons, and you're still in diapers... On the flip side of that, someone who's been a Christian for two or three years uh, could be far more spiritually developed than someone who's been a Christian for 50 years. It all depends on how they've applied themselves and what they've done in studying the Word of God and striving to understand all they can to grow for God's glory. But what does that look like for the Christian to move on from the milk of babes to the meat of those who are of full age? Well, the writer continues that thought as we proceed into chapter 6. It says there in the first three verses, <clears throat> Therefore, leaving the, the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of the laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Now in order to understand what's meant by these first three verses, we have to look at it through the lens of the people who received this. Because there is an important aspect of the context here of what we're studying. Remember, these Christians were struggling with unbelief. So much so, they were wanting to return to the law of Moses. They were wanting to go back to Judaism. They were wanting to <laughs> forsake Jesus and go back to the law. So the writer's commanding them to put away... Those ideas and those desires that they have that are related to that old system of worship that has passed away. And those traditions that are connected with those, uh, with, those, uh, with those teachings that are drawing them back. 
They need to put those things out of their minds so that they could have a clear mind to focus and to embrace the new system that was ushered in by Jesus Christ as a fulfillment of the law. Jesus didn't destroy the law, but he fulfilled it. It was nailed to the cross, and he shed his blood, and his blood purchased the church. The command to leave the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ is also translated leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ. We know that the Jews for centuries had wondered who the Christ would be. They thought about it. They looked at those prophecies. But in all their dreaming, they had come up with ideas that did not represent what God had revealed to the prophets. And thus many of the Jews had an error understanding of who the Christ would be. And this was also the case for the rest of these elementary principles listed here. And perhaps as they remained in their spiritually immature state, they began to doubt what they once emphatically believed concerning Jesus and what Jesus taught and what they had heard from the apostles. So the writer's telling them to leave those errant teachings of the Jews behind. Stop laying the foundation that brought you to Christ over and over and over again, and then let us go on to perfection. They were focusing so much on those things that brought them to Christ that they were failing to go on to perfection. And it was causing them to lose their belief that Jesus was the Christ at all. And they were thinking about going back to Judaism, as we've talked about many times. But what can we learn from this? We learn that we will never move on to perfection if we're trying to have one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world. You can't do that. We can't have one foot in our new life and one foot in our old life. When we're baptized, we bury the old man and we rise as a new creature to walk in the newness of life. We cannot straddle the fence, spiritually speaking. Nor can we move on to perfection if we are in the kingdom and we know the basics and we're satisfied with that knowledge. We cannot be satisfied with the milk and not strive to grow. There was a legendary musician by the name of Pablo Casals that I was reading about. And uh, he was 90 years old, and he was still practicing playing his instrument. He practiced every day. And finally somebody asked him, they said, why do you keep practicing playing your instrument at age 90? You've traveled all over the world, and you've played in these big concert halls. You're world-renowned. Why do you continue to practice this? He said, because I think I'm making progress. Isn't that an attitude that we should have as Christians? I don't care if you're 95 years old and you've been a Christian for 70 years. You still have growing to do. You have growing to do until you draw your final breath on this earth. You're never going to be at a point where you can stop and say, Well, I've heard all these sermons. I've studied the Bible. I've read through the Bible 20 times. I think I know enough. I think I've got it pretty much figured out. I'm just going to sit in my recliner and wait for things to come to an end. You're not going to be pleasing to God in that condition. As simple as that. We have to continue to strive for growth every day as we go through our life. But see, the perfection that he's talking about, he says, let us go on to perfection. <coughs> well, that perfection is referring to maturity in Christ. And that should be our goal as Christians. We know that the starting point of growing toward maturity is abandoning our old way of thinking. We have to make a decision to use the knowledge that we have of the saving power of the gospel to motivate us to wean ourselves off the milk and then move on to the meat. But what does that process look like for us? Well, see, so you're not going to be drinking milk on day one as a Christian and then day two be on the meat. It doesn't happen that quickly. There is an element of time that it requires for us to be able to learn and to gain knowledge and to grow. That's just part of it. It's gradual. The growth that we experience is gradual, and that's what we learn from what the Apostle Peter teaches about Christian growth in 2 Peter chapter, five, chapter 1, verse 5 through 11. These things that he tells us to add to our faith are gradual steps. He says first that we must add to our faith virtue, then the virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. And we can read that over in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 through 11. There's a little bit I want to read surrounding those, those things. It says there in verse 5, 
But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter says that we are to add to our faith. Now, whenever we initially have that faith that is required to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have this little flame that starts. And as we continue, we have to continue to add to that flame to keep the fire going or the fire is going to go out. That's what's happened to these people. That's what happens to people all the time. They have the little flame, then the problems of this world dash a bucket of cold water onto it, and it goes out. But if we're going to remain in the faith, if we're going to continue to grow in our faith, if we're going to be able to hear those welcome words of Jesus on the day of judgment, then we have to continue to add to that flame until it's a roaring fire. And that's going to happen by adding to it. We add to our faith virtue. That word virtue means moral excellence. That means that we make that faith that we have in Jesus Christ the center of our life. That guides every decision that we make. It guides every relationship that we build. It is the foundation of everything that we do. Our schedules, our hobbies, our activities, our vacations, whatever it is, we make our faith in Jesus Christ the center of it all. And that takes courage. We have to have courage to do some of those things. Because if we're going to have that kind of virtue, that we have that moral excellence, and we're striving to keep that faith the center of our life, we can't allow anything else to get in that position. Nothing else can get into that place as center of our life, whether it be our family or our friends, our careers, hobbies, relationships. We have to be willing to get rid of anything that is trying to take the place of that thing that is the foundation and the center of our life. Because if we don't, we're going to end up like these people here. We're going to think about quitting Jesus, aren't we? We're going to think about going back into the world. And we can't let that happen to us. So upon our virtue, we then have to build knowledge. Now, this faith that we have that is burning in us is going to drive us to learn all that we can about the one who saved us, to learn all we can about God, to find out what his will and plan is for our life. Like we said before, if we want to know what God's will is for us, we have to look at what the word of God says. We don't find it anywhere else. It has nothing to do with how we feel or something that we hear or think that we hear. It's all in the word. So we have to strive for that knowledge. Because we cannot be pleasing to God unless we have knowledge and we cannot follow God's word and we cannot live out his will unless we know what his will is. And that's the only place that we can learn it is in the word of God. So upon that knowledge, we must add self-control. Now why is that a logical next step to adding knowledge? It's a logical next step because as we study the word of God and as we learn more about it, we're going to find out that our natural feelings... Our instincts, those inclinations that we have, are not what guide our life. We don't guide our life with those things. Because the Word of God teaches us things that contradict those instincts, contradicts those feelings that we might have. I've had a lot of people tell me, well, I feel like I'm doing the right thing. I feel like the way I'm living or, or the way I'm worshiping, I feel like those things are right. It just feels right. It feels good. It feels true. I feel uplifted. I feel motivated. I feel like I've been blessed. Well, you might have a feeling like that, but does that mean that feeling is true? If that feeling contradicts what the Word of God teaches, then it is not true. Because the Word of God is the source of all truth. Our feelings are not the source of all truth. In Proverbs it says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. That will lead us straight to hell if we follow our feelings rather than following the word of God. So after we've gotten a hold of self-control, then we can start to add perseverance to that. Because if we're willing to control ourselves, then we're going to be willing to press forward toward that heavenly goal. We can push through all of those difficult temptations that we have. 
We can push through all of those hard days, all of those devastating events that happen in all of our lives. We can persevere. We can push through it if we take care of trying to do all these other things first. And then, once we have made it our goal and our aim to push through and to persevere toward eternity, then we add godliness to that. <coughs> and what is godliness? Well, that's talking about living to the standards that God has set up. Now, I don't want anybody to think that there's someone in here who is perfectly godly. That's never happened except for one time, and that was Jesus Christ. But we should make it our aim to be well-pleasing to him. And we do that by following the word. And that's godliness. And then we have brotherly kindness. And this is a really important thing. And you might say, well, well, I, I, I took care of brotherly kindness up here. No, you didn't. But there's a difference in kindness and brotherly kindness. It's easy to be kind to people. It's easy to put on a good face. It's easy to, uh, to talk about things with people and to pretend like you're being kind to them and you care about what they're having to say. But brotherly kindness is a special kind of kindness and love that is shown toward your brethren. It's not like showing kindness to the world. Brotherly kindness is something that we share specially as Christians in the body of Christ. We share that kindness together. And that's something that we should all be striving to develop. And that's something that comes all later on. That's closer to maturity in Christ, is brotherly kindness. Because we add to brotherly kindness, love. Now this love is the peak. And this is very difficult to do. It's not easy to... Uh, to attain this kind of love. It's important that we have this kind of love because our church family is going to be our family forever. But this love is a genuine concern not only for our church family and for our brothers and sisters in Christ, but it is a genuine love and concern for all people in the world. And I think we know down deep if we have that kind of care and we have that kind of love for people. That is the pinnacle of Christian maturity. So when the Hebrew writer says, let us go on to perfection, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about developing these things and striving toward maturity. That's what he's talking about there when he says, let us go on to perfection. You see, the writer knows that this letter is going to be received in one of two ways. One, the individual will accept the rebuke then repent, be encouraged, and then begin the process of going on to perfection. That's what the honest heart will do. But then on the other hand, there's probably someone who received this letter, who hears it, and they reject the rebuke, they refuse to believe, and then they depart. That's the two ways that a person can respond to this rebuke. And those who would refuse to believe what they once did are the subject of these next five verses. But we're just going to look at verse 4 through 6 to start off. It says, <clears throat> this is a hard teaching. <clears throat> for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away... To renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. So the writer here lists five things that the Christian has experienced, but refuses to continue to believe and forsakes the promises of God. So this is this is a warning toward those who have already been, become Christians, who are already members of the church. So everyone who's reading this letter has one been enlightened. That means they've been converted to Jesus Christ. They've tasted the heavenly gift. That means their sins have been forgiven. They've been made partakers of the Holy Spirit in the sense and measure that everyone partakes in the Holy Spirit uh, whenever they're converted. And they have tasted the good word of God, which is the source of all truth and the power of God unto salvation. And they have tasted the powers of the age to come. Now, when we, we have to remember, like we talked about in chapter 1, 
Whenever the writer is referring to the age to come, he's talking about the age that we're in now. He's talking about the age that these people were in now. And that's kind of confusing because why would he tell them in the age to come when he's talking about while they're, what they're experiencing right now? Well, it's because he's appealing to their knowledge of the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, the age, the Christian age, is referred to as the age to come. So he's using knowledge that, from, that they have in the Old Testament to describe the time that they're living in now. So when he speaks of the powers of the age to come, he's speaking of the spiritual gifts that are in the, age, in the age that they're living in, which the Old Testament is calling the age to come. So they've experienced all these wonderful and powerful blessings from God, and they've experienced it because of the blood of Jesus Christ. But some of them have still decided to fall away. Some of them who were still in the church here, they were hearing this letter. They probably had their hearts so hardened that no matter what they heard from this letter, they were still going to leave, even after hearing this warning. But what does the writer say about these people? And it's a strong statement, too. And it's a tough teaching. He says it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. These are strong words delivered by the Holy Spirit. But what are we to understand by this warning? It's impossible to bring about life-changing repentance in a man who deliberately rejects Jesus after they have experienced all the blessings that he has to bestow in this life. And you reject Jesus after all of that, then what could you possibly what could possibly convince you to repent? You think about the case of these people. They witnessed spiritual gifts by the power of God in that age that were special for that time until the word of God was complete. And they still decided to leave. They still left. So what's going to convince them to return, if not that, to keep them there? What will do it? I was talking to a brother the other morning about the devil and his angels. And we entertained the question, well, could the devil and his angels repent? No. You know why they can't repent? Because they were in the presence of God himself and decided to disobey him and to reject him. What's going to convince them to repent? What's going to convince them to change if they've been in the presence of God himself? Nothing will. So when you deliberately reject Jesus after experiencing all the things the writer listed, it says that you crucify again for yourself the Son of God and put him to an open shame. But what does that mean? That means that one who does this is saying, in effect, as far as I'm concerned, Jesus deserved to be crucified. He wasn't doing anything for me whenever, I, whenever he died for me. He wasn't doing anything for me when he died. That's what you're saying, in effect, when you do that. Now, I'm not saying this is the case for everyone who falls into sin and veers off the path. There's a difference between someone who makes a mistake and veers off the path and knows the whole time that it's wrong and that they shouldn't be doing it, that they need to get back in, in the church, they need to repent, they need to get back on the path. There's a difference between that person and the person who leaves and refuses to believe. They lose their belief and nothing that anyone tells them will convince them to believe in Jesus again. They deliberately reject Jesus as the Christ. If a person rejects Jesus as the Christ, then how can they repent? It's not possible because it's the blood of Christ that allows us to repent. We know the scripture teaches us in Acts chapter 8 and John chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 1 uh, that when we make mistakes that we can repent and we can confess our sins to God. And he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's something that we can do if we have fallen short, if we have made a mistake, if we have veered off the path. But one who deliberately rejects God, rejects Jesus, and refuses to believe after they have experienced all the blessings of that relationship, they will not repent. That's why it says it is impossible for them to repent because they will not. Verse 7. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessings from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and here to be cursed, whose end is to be burned. So the writer concludes his thoughts on this subject with an illustration. And it's creating a contrast between the faithful Christian and the one we talked about who's, who's leaving. 
The Christian who makes it their aim to be well-pleasing to God by striving toward maturity, they're like this fertile field that produces fruit, and they shall receive a blessing from God for that. <clears throat> and the apostate, the one who leaves, the one who deliberately rejects Jesus and leaves the church and serves their own desires, they're like the briars and the thorns of the field. God rejects them, and they will face eternal separation from God in hell fire. That's what it's talking about whenever it says that they shall be burned. But there's good news to all of this. There's good news for these people then. There's good news for us today. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is still the same. The gospel of Christ still has its power. Jesus came to earth. He lived a perfect life. He didn't sin. He didn't fall short. He didn't transgress any of God's commands. He not only did that, but he suffered. He was crucified on a cross. And he died for our sins. He resurrected on the third day, proving beyond any shadow of a doubt that he is who he claimed to be. Then he ascended into heaven. And he's coming back to get us someday. But he's only going to come back and receive those who are in the fold. Who have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who are continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Who are making it their aim each day to be well-pleasing to him. Now, you can either look to that day of judgment with joy, or you can look ahead to that with terror in your heart. But that is your own decision. You can make preparations for that day. You can uh, make efforts toward that day. You can either serve the Lord Jesus and strive toward maturity as you travel the path, or you can reject Jesus. But I'm going to beg of you along with the rest of the congregation, please do not reject Jesus. He is your only hope for salvation. And you cannot wash your own sins away. Only the blood of Christ can do that. We can do nothing to wash our sins away. It is only Him. So we ask that you come today. Don't be a part of those who, upon Jesus' return, place that flaming fire and vengeance of those who know not God and who obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ. If there's someone here this morning who has never obeyed the gospel, the first thing that you have to do to obey the gospel is you have to hear the word of God preached. We hear about Jesus, those prophecies that he fulfilled, and that gives us the assurance that we need to believe that he is the Son of God. Jesus said, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins in, Acts cha in, uh, in uh, John chapter 8 and verse 24. You must also, if you believe in Jesus Christ, be willing to repent of your sins. That is a change of heart or a change of mind that results in a change in action. Repent or you will all likewise perish as you thought. We must also be willing to confess that he is the son of God without shame. Just as the Ethiopian eunuch did in Acts chapter 8, he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And then once you've made that good confession, you are to be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. Now, there is no power in the water. The water does not save us. What saves us is that obedient act. We put all of these steps together, hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and baptism, and that is the whole unit of the salvation process. If you take one piece out, it doesn't work. You don't have that connection with Jesus. You don't enter that relationship. You don't have your sins washed away. We are saved when we are baptized. That's the point when we're baptized. Now, if, if you're baptized and you don't believe, it doesn't do you any good. You're just going down a dry center and coming up a wet one. You're just taking a bath. But baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. So if there's someone here who has never obeyed the gospel and obeyed it in this way, we invite you to come. But if there's one who has already obeyed the gospel, maybe you went back to this world, maybe you've been living for yourself and not living for the Lord, as you know you should, then we hope that you'll return today. And we'll be happy to pray with you and for you. If there's one who is subject to the gospel invitation, we ask that you come now as we stand and sing.